Greetings, teachers, and welcome to the second day of the 2020 Holocaust Center Teachers Institute. Uh, this is once again Mitch Bloomer, the resource teacher at the Holocaust Center. And this afternoon, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to our institute uh, a great friend of the Holocaust Center, local author Greg Dawson. Uh, and uh, Greg, you and I have, have uh, had a history um, bringing your family and your mother's story to the Central Florida community, uh, and we're happy to give you another opportunity to share. Now, teachers, uh, one of the books that you'll be working toward is Hiding in the Spotlight, which is Greg's book about his mother and aunt's experience during the time of the Holocaust in Ukraine. And, um, there it is. And so this is great incentive uh, that you you continue to participate in all the activities because we absolutely uh, want to give that book to you and you will find it to be a tre treasured part of your library. So welcome, Greg. Why don't we kick off uh, this afternoon just by um, taking a few moments for you to, to give the teachers um, the, the basics of your, your, your mother's story. Uh, thank you, Mitch. And Great to see you again uh, at this distance. So zooming along with Mitch, and uh, it's a pleasure. And I just want to say that I've really so enjoyed all the the uh, uh, the, the conversations we've had over the year. The privilege of making presentations at the Holocaust uh, Center, uh, which you have developed into such a great resource for the for the community. And and uh, I've learned a great deal uh, from working with you and use the library there as a resource in writing my books. And so it's always, it's just great. Never gets old, Mitch, to, to see you and to, to talk about this with you. And it's a pleasure to talk today to those at the, uh, who are attending the Institute about, uh, about my mother's story. So I'm gonna give a kind of a brief summary as about the story and maybe a bit about how I came to, to, to learn about it because that is relevant to one of the things we're gonna be talking about today, which is the, um, the just now the, the, the really we're still in the early dawn of public awareness of the Holocaust in Ukraine where my mother is from um, and it's it's still a relatively unknown subject in this country most of us my age I graduated from high school in 1968 um, to school 50s and 60s and m most of most people my age grew up knowing uh, very little learning, very little about the Holocaust in school, if anything. And today, even today, with students who do get that, there's still very little uh, relatively uh, taught about the Holocaust in Ukraine. And it's uh, the predominant information people are familiar with has to do with Western Europe, the events of Western Europe in uh, places like Poland and Germany and Auschwitz and Dachau and those horrible places that were came to be these dark icons of the Holocaust and are so important in the history of the Holocaust. But there's a whole other earlier chapter, the first chapter uh, of the Holocaust really, uh, that, uh, that, that opened, occurred in the Ukraine where my mother is from. And that's what my mother, that's what my book is about. It's called Hiding in the Spotlight. And it's, uh, my wife Candy came up with that Came up with that wonderful title because it expresses, as I'll explain in a moment, it's a perfect expression of uh, literally and figuratively of her, of her story. Um, she, my mother uh, was born in far eastern Ukraine, uh, the part that's been in such dispute over the last few years between uh, now the independent Ukraine and, and Russia. And uh, she grew up there in a Jewish family. Uh, not religiously Jewish, but proudly uh, culturally Jewish. And uh, she was born in 19, 1927. And uh, her father was uh, a candy maker in a small town near the Sea of Azov, which is not too far from the Black Sea. And he was a candy maker, and, but his main love in, in life was, uh, was a musician, was music. He was an amateur violinist. And um, his dream was to have his, his daughters, my mother, whose name was Jana, and her younger sister by two years, Frina, to become great musicians someday. And so he, uh, when they were very, very young, he bought them a, a piano from, ironically enough, a Beckstein piano from Germany, had it imported. And, and so they started, uh, my mother started uh, taking piano lessons very young, uh, 
and um, when she was five and at six years old, she played her first public performance of Bach on a, on a local radio station in her, in her small town. So uh, she and her sister went on to get uh, extremely coveted, unusual uh, scholarships from a music conservatory in, in, uh, in Ukraine, in the city where they moved to ultimately. And uh, they went through that, that conservatory and they became at a very young age, wonderful, uh, wonderful pianists. Uh, and they did performances, they did performances in their town. They became kind of minor celebrities. And uh, they were really having a wonderful life until, until 1941, uh, when uh, the, the Germans invaded the Ukraine. Uh, the Germans had, before that, the Germans, as you were saying earlier, had invaded Poland in 1939. And that's really when the war started and they did go into Poland, but there was no Holocaust then. There was no systematic extermination of Jews. Jews were, line, uh, were rounded up as were us to a lesser degree, other minorities such as you know, there are some uh, us, the uh, gypsies and Catholics and others, but predominantly uh, there were Jews that were rounded up by the Germans, but they were put in ghettos and camp and prisons. They were not system, the, the systematic, extermination of Jews had not yet had not yet started or even been conceived of at that point. It wasn't until 1941 uh, when the uh, when the, uh, the German the Germans invaded the Ukraine uh, in June that the, the the Holocaust as we know it, which is the systematic extermination of Jews, that's when it started. The regular German army, the Wehrmacht, marched through Ukraine from west to east on their way to Stalingrad, uh, which they hoped to take. And they thought it was gonna be quick work and they would take over the country and then colonize it with, with Germans. But they invaded and the regular German army was followed by, as you alluded to earlier, uh, uh, the, something called the Einsatzgruppen, which were mobile killing squads uh, that their only job as the army would go through was to uh, was to get to each town, stop in the town, collect all the Jews they could, uh, and uh, take them to the edge of town and murder them, uh, not with gas, there are no gas chambers yet, uh, but to take them, line them up in front of these massive dishes, uh, ditches and machine gun them or shoot them in the head with pistols and push them into these open graves. And, and in this manner, um, up to, it, there were at least half a million Ukrainians who were murdered in this fashion, probably upwards more of, of 70, 70, uh, 750,000, if not a million, who were murdered in this fashion, even before the death camps like Auschwitz uh, and Treblinka uh, even began operation in the, in, the, uh, in the spring of 1942. So that's when the, extern the Holocaust as we know it began, was in the Ukraine. This is not something that has became part of the early or the accepted, even still best known narrative of the, of the, um, of the Holocaust in this country. And there are reasons for that we can discuss maybe later. Um, but this is the, the world in which my mother lived in 1941. And ultimately the, 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 the Germans reached her city in far Eastern Ukraine. They followed their plan. They rounded up all the Jews that they could find in her town, 16,000. Uh, they uh, put uh, my mother's family, uh, her sister, her parents, and two grandparents became part of this, this uh, group, this, this sea of 16,000 condemned Jews who were uh, put on this death march. Uh, they were lied to. The Germans said they were going to a labor camp, but of course that was not true. And they took them to, um, they took them to the edge of town and, and proceeded to murder them uh, in the fashion I described earlier. And my mother, um, my mother miraculously managed to escape this death march. Her father bribed a, a Ukrainian a collaborator, one of collaborating with the, one of the guards who were following this, this group of, of Jews on their death march bribed him with a gold watch to turn his head for us for a, for a second so my mother could jump out of line and disappear into the woods and um, escape this march. And she did. Um, her sister, 
uh, also managed to, to escape. To this day, we don't know her sister. My aunt died a couple of years ago. Um, she declined to be interviewed for the book. So I was never sure how she escaped, but they did both escape. They both went back, they found their way back to their town and, and, um, and they changed their identities. They assumed new non-Jewish identities and spent the rest of the war um, uh, performing for the Nazis who didn't know they were Jewish. You know, the Germans, one of the great um, inexplicable iron, uh, dichotomies, ironies of, of human behavior is how the Germans, uh, from, from the very highest high command down to the foot soldiers, um, these were music lovers. They came from a culture that uh, of Beethoven and Bach and the other great, the great foundations of classical music. And, and uh, they respected and they revered that. And yet the other side of that brain and, and, and many of the other side of it harbored these genocidal instincts about Jews. And, and so uh, they, the Nazis were happy to, 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 uh, to use my mother and her sister to perform for them and entertain their troops. And, um, and my mother saw the evidence of both sides. She was treated, oddly enough, by the Gestapo and the field generals. Again, she was 14 years old at the time. Her sister was 12. And she would be uh, called in to dine with these officers and these Gestapo. And they were so courtly and so polite to her. And they would dine. And then afterwards, she and her sister would play for them, uh, private concerts. And then the next morning, these same men would go out and they would murder hundreds or thousands of Jews in that same, in those same towns. So uh, th this is again, an inexplicable dichotomy in human nature that probably will never be explained. But that, uh, so for five years, my mother and her sister uh, uh, survived in this manner. They kept their Jewish identities secret, although there were more than one occasion in which they thought they were going to be outed. They would also be sent to Auschwitz. And, uh, but they, but they did, they weren't. And so they survived the war. After the war, they went to a displaced persons camp near, near Munich. And they had planned to, my mother wanted to go back to Russia, USSR at the time, after the, after the war. She'd always wanted to go back. Her sister did not. But uh, while they were in the DP camp, uh, they found, they were there for many months and they were bored out of their minds. And so one day they were wandering around the camp and they found a hall with an old piano in it. And so they sat down and they started to play to entertain themselves and ultimately other uh, prisoners, or not prisoners, but detainees in the camp. One day, uh, an American officer wandered into the hall and uh, he was actually the one who ran, who was in charge of this camp. And he was transfixed by their music. He was a music lover and from uh, a lieutenant from, from uh, Virginia. And so he introduced himself and persuaded these girls that he was going to take them to America where they, and get them into the Juilliard and they were going to become great artists. Of course, they had no idea what the Juilliard was or anything else, but he did it. He got them. when Harry Truman loosened up the, loosened up the, uh, uh, the quotas. And so the, they were on the first ship. They were the first two, only two Russians on, on that ship. There were now approximately 900 Holocaust survivors. They were the only two Russians. There was actually, the U.S. had no formal uh, quota for Russians then because, uh, because of the Soviet Union. And so they were the only Russians and they got to New York in May of 1946. And, uh, and then uh, the, I won't go into the rest of the story. Uh, it's very, it's recounted in the book that when they get to America, quite an adventure when they got to America, they did ultimately, first place they went was to, by the way, the man who got them on the boat, his name was Larry Dawson. Well, my mother ultimately ended up marrying his brother, David Dawson, who was a wonderful uh, musician. He was a violist who also attended uh, Juilliard. Uh, he was somewhat earlier. He was 14 years older than my mother. But, um, uh, but ultimately, they both, Jana and Frina, both went to Juilliard. And um, after that, they uh, went 
their different ways and they both married musicians. And uh, uh, my mother uh, married my father at uh, 1948 before she had completed Juilliard. He had gotten a job uh, at the School of Music at Indiana University playing in a, playing in a string quartet and teaching. So in 1948, they, they moved to Indiana where I was born and then later, five years later, my brother. So, uh, so that was her story. It's a unique story because it's a unique story in two respects. Uh, it, it breaks the mold of most Holocaust stories. Number one, uh, they were Ukrainian. And there, you can look, there are very, very few uh, stories about Ukrainian survivors in large part because so few Jews in the Ukraine survived that part of the Holocaust. The German army was never more ruthless or efficient than it was when it was murdering Jews in the Ukraine. Why? Because the Red Army at the start of the war was in, no, was in disarray. And so the, the German military moved through Ukraine like a hot knife through butter. They had no opposition. And so when they would reach these towns, the Jews were entirely defenseless. And and so there were very, very few Ukrainian survivors. Um, so that's uh, that is uh, the, that's the, that's the prim that's the, prim the primary primary reason. So, um, Greg, so, there was yes, mm -hmm. there was yes, one yes. part of of your your um, your grandfather's story that I thought would be interesting to highlight. Um, he did not expect the Germans to behave with such brutality uh, when they pushed eastward into Ukraine. Why was that? Why did he have an expectation uh, that, that the Germans would behave in a civilized manner? Yeah, th th that's a really an excellent question. I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you asked that, Mitch, because it, 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 uh, it's because, uh, and um, it's because he, he was a music lover. And he, he during World War I, he had actually been a young boy in Poltava, which is a small town in, uh, in the same part of Ukraine. And when the German, and Germans in World War I had peacefully occupied many places in the Ukraine, they didn't do to the Ukraine then what they did in the Second World War. And so he had actually befriended a lot of the German soldiers who occupied his town during World War I. And he found them. He found them to be uh, music lovers. They had a lot in common. And he he let's face it. The most of the German soldiers, like all Germans and all like all soldiers and all armies, I guess in the history of the world, the foot soldiers usually are just average people. They're not part of the high command. They're not the ones who conceived of the Holocaust or anything like that. They were just soldiers. And she he found he liked the Germans, and they were music lovers like him. And so. And he revered that culture above all others uh, for its music. And, and so uh, that's why when he, is, he bought, uh, he went to the trouble and the expense of importing a German piano at Beckstein for his young daughters. So when the, when the, when the war started and the, uh, and the Germans invaded, he, like others in Ukraine, did receive uh, rumors and then actual word that the that the Germans were coming through and they were exterminating Jews. Many, many Jews uh, in, in uh, the town where they lived, Haikov, looks like Americans say Kharkov, but it's pronounced Haikov. Many Jews did flee. They went east to the Urals or Siberia to escape the Germans, uh, including um, members of my mother's extended family, cousins and so on. He didn't move his family because he said, I just don't believe it. I don't believe it's true. I've met these people. They're good people. They love music. They would never do what, what we hear, what they're said to be doing to exterminate the Jews. Why would they do that? So he simply didn't believe it. And, and uh, he never believed it until, uh, until the day that they were actually on the death march and the Germans told them they were being taken to a, a labor camp uh, in a certain town, and when they got to a, a fork in the road, so to speak, uh, he knew where that town was. And when they they turned the Germans, turned the the group of the the people on the death march, turned them in the other direction. At that point, he thought it's true, it's true. We're not going to we're not going to a labor camp. They're taking us to this killing field. 
And so, but it was because of his love for that culture. And he was blinded in a sense by his, by his reverence for his love for music. Um, and so that is, uh, and he, probably many, many other people, whether they were Ukrainians or whether they're in this country, also had the same disbelief. There's a famous story about the Supreme Court uh, Justice uh, Felix Frankfurter, who's a Jew, who was a Jew. During the war, after the Holocaust was really underway, uh, there's a man whose name I can't remember right now, but he was a, a resistance fighter who had managed to escape Germany during the war. And he came to the United States in an attempt to, to wake people up, to say, you know, you, you have to pay attention. The Jews are being exterminated in far larger numbers than you can imagine. And he sort of went around, spoke to anybody who would listen in this country to, 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 to get people to, to wake up to what was happening. And one of the people he spoke to was, was Justice Frankfurter. And, um, and the story is that after he, after he gave his report on what was happening there, and he had, as a, it was a firsthand report, his own, he, was a, he was a witness to it, that Frankfurt was said, reported to have said to him, he said, I know what you say is true, I just don't believe it. So th that was the level of disbelief uh, by people, not only my, grand, my, my grandfather, but this justice of the Supreme Court. And um, as I said, it goes back to what I was saying about this dichotomy that seems so inexplicable. So sure. that was an important, that's an, that was an important point, yes. And, and Greg, uh, just, just for the benefit of the teachers uh, listening, uh, the gentleman that Greg just referred to uh, was a courier in the Polish underground. His name was Jan Karski. Um, after the war, Jan Karski came to the United States and taught political science at Georgetown University for many, many years. Um, and was still very active in the field of, of uh, Holocaust research and scholarship, um, really all the way up. Even even after I was uh, at the Holocaust Center, he was uh, he was still around and um, and, and was a, a very influential voice um, in telling this story. And and I, I would like to add just to to what you said, Greg. Um, we would like to be able to place a great deal of faith in culture and education and refinement uh, as protections against the brutality that was um, that was so evident during the Holocaust. But if we place faith in education and culture and refinement, uh, we are flying in the face of reality uh, because many of the killers uh, in the Holocaust were men of education and culture and refinement and it did not stop them from killing. Um, now, None of that is to say that education, culture, and refinement are bad things. They are not. They are just not a safeguard against the type of crime that happened in the Holocaust. So it's one of those complexities of history as well as an irony of history that we should really study in, in great detail uh, to try to, to explain. And that then is not only using the vehicle of history, but also psychology and sociology and anthropology and political science and the other disciplines uh, to help us come up with a more uh, accurate and well-rounded picture of what happened during the Holocaust. Um, and, and very rarely in studying the history of the Holocaust do you end up patting yourself on the back with pride over being human. Um, however, there are some there are some wonderful uplifting stories about people who who acted as rescuers and and who swam against the tide so to speak and and we'll mention them later in this institute um but numerically there were not many of them compared to uh the types of people we've just been talking about so so greg um we we have now a, a thumbnail sketch of of your mom's experience and her larger family experience. Um, let me shift gears with you just for a moment and ask you, um, how did you become aware of, of this story over time? What did you know when you were a young kid? Um, and then how gradually over time did you come to know your mother's experience? They, they, that's, that's, that's the, uh, I go into that in the book and it's very interesting because Again, it does probably mirror other people's experiences, but uh, people of my age. But um, 
when when I was growing up, I grew up uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, which is in southern Indiana, home to Indiana University, um, and uh, and so it was. Uh, you know, by the way, I came from, I grew up in, in a secular home, which is important because that's an important uh, thing to remember in terms of when I found out or how late I found out. Um, my father had been a Catholic when he was a young boy, Roman Catholic. Um, and my mother was a secular, her family was secular Jews. They're proud of her Jewish heritage, but they did not go to synagogue. And so I grew up in a, when my parents were, were married, uh, you know, just they, my father had, uh, fallen away from his religion, and my mother was never really religious in that way, so I grew up in a secular home. Well, in Bloomington, Indiana, growing up, I didn't really think anything about that. Uh, it, most of my friends went to church on Sundays, which was just part of, part of my life, and it just meant that I had to wait until Sunday afternoon to find anybody to play with, right? And that's, that was about it. Uh, also, this is something that sticks with you if you experience as a kid. The other thing is I didn't grow up in a religious home. And so when I would be invited to dinner, most of the families would say grace before dinner. And of course, I bow my head and I always lived in terror that they would call on me to say the prayer. And I thought, I don't know any. So uh, that never happened. But, but that's, a, that's a kind of indicative of, of my, in, in part, you know, my, my childhood that I knew. And um, it was, uh, and again, uh, all I knew about my mother is I definitely knew she was Russian because she sp spoke Russian to me until I was five years old. I was really bilingual. And uh, so I was acutely aware that nobody else had a mother who spoke Russian or played the piano several hours a day. She would practice at home. Uh, but I knew nothing about her um, early life uh, except that she, she was Russian and she had come to this country after the war. Um, that's all I knew. I didn't know much about the war at that age, um, and um, I, I never, I never really, I never asked her. It was just I described all I really knew about her, and um, and so later on, after this book came out, somebody asked me a very interesting question. They said, "Well, didn't you ask her about your grandparents, her parents, who of course had been died, who had been." murdered and uh, during the war. And I said, no, I never did. And I thought I never really thought about that. I never did ask, what about your mother and father? And I thought, well, why would that be the case? Because most children have grandparents in their life. And I realized, you know, looking back on it, I didn't, and I didn't ask about it. All I could, all I could imagine was that my, I didn't really have grandparents on my other side that I knew well. My father's father, my grandfather, had died when he was 12, so I never knew him. And then his mother died when I was quite young, so I never really had any relationship with her. So I didn't really have grandparents on either side, so I never thought to ask about them. If I had ever thought to ask about them, she might have at that point told me more about what happened, about her experience, but I never did. So, um, Time went on, and um, I never really uh, became aware of anything about her true story, her complete story, until really many years later. Um, I was a reporter and columnist for the, uh, the paper in Bloomington, and 1978, and you'll remember this, so perhaps some others in, in the audience will, 1978, NBC presented the first uh, American television treatment of the Holocaust, the full-scale treatment. There had been, over the years, some episodes of different series that touched lightly in an indirect way on the Holocaust, but, uh, but this was the first uh, major treatment in a miniseries by a, by a TV network on NBC. It was like eight hours over three nights, I think. And it was a major uh, television, social, cultural event in this country. And I was a columnist for the local paper, as I said, at the time, and always looking for ideas. And so I read, I read uh, all the hype for the miniseries coming up, and I thought, there must be a column in here for me somewhere. I thought, well, you know, maybe I can ask my mother about, ask her if she had any experiences during the war that, that related to this in any way. And so um, I called her up. At that point, my dad had died a few years earlier. She was living in Milwaukee, teaching at the university up there. And so I called her up one day and I said, hey, mom, uh, 
there was a show coming on uh, and uh, about this Holocaust, and I described it. I said, I thought, you know, I thought about doing a column and wonder if you have any memories that might relate to this in any way. And boy, did she. <laughs> that was the first time she, she proceeded to give me uh, uh, the first time a, a real broad but lengthy outline of the story that I described earlier in my, in my summary. And of course, I was stunned. I was astonished because I had no idea that uh, I had no idea what a survivor was or anything. And, and I didn't knew none of this. And so, but I was, I knew enough to know that I had stumbled on uh, a pretty great story and it would make a terrific column. And so I took notes frantically for uh, an hour on the phone and turned in a very, very long uh, column uh, in which I recounted her, her story as she told it to me. 1978. And so that was really when I was 30, I was 30 then. And so that was the first time I knew anything about this. And, uh, and so then, um, you know, I kind of, I'd been encouraged, Candy encouraged me and other people encouraged me to, to maybe broaden this and write a book about it. Um, and I thought maybe, but I was not really a book writer, you know, by, I was a reporter. And by, by temperament, by instinct, and by experience, I was a reporter, a columnist, and I just didn't ever see myself as a book writer. And so I frankly didn't think I would be able to do it or do the story justice. So I just didn't, I just put it aside. And, uh, and then it wasn't, until, it wasn't until 1994 that there was a real breakthrough that led to the writing of the book, uh, our daughter Amy, was a uh, was a student at Glen Ridge Middle School, and 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 um, uh, her history teacher, a wonderful man named um, Ron Hartle, um, history teacher, gave the students an assignment to interview uh, someone they knew in their family, uh, a, probably a grandparent, about what life was like when they were the same age as the student was, thirteen, whatever. And, and so Amy came home one day with this assignment, told us about it, and, um, and at that point, she really didn't have any, any other grandparents uh, that she could, the only grandparent she had left, really, was uh, my mother. And so um, she said, well, um, her name, my mother's name is Jana, Z-H-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, like Jaja, Jana, that pronunciation. <clears throat> but... Uh, the kids, uh, Amy and, and, her, and her brother, uh, called, uh, called her Z. And so he, she said, well, you know, I'm going to write a letter to Z and ask her if I can, I can um, talk to her about her experience. We told her a little bit about it. And, um, and so we said, okay. And we thought, well, good luck with that because she, we knew how reluctant my mother was to speak about the subject. And so we said, well, okay. And so uh, she wrote a one-page letter to my mother asking her, saying, you know, I'd like to know more. Are there any, were there any, um, were there any big world events that took place when you were my age, you know, 14? And, um, and so much to our surprise, amazement, a couple of weeks later, Amy received a, uh, a long hand, handwritten uh, five-page letter from my mother recounting for the first time in really emotional terms, personal emotional terms, unlike what she had given me, which is more sort of a factual outline of the, of the story, telling Amy what happened and what it felt like to go through it um, in very strong personal terms, lots of emotion. And, and it was the first time it was, you know how it is with grandkids, sometimes they have a special relationship with their, with their, um, uh, with their grandparents. And, and that was the first time my mother had really unburdened herself in that way. And then that really opened the door to her uh, speaking um, more about it and her willingness ultimately to sit down with me and do the interviews that, that led, to the, led to the book, um, uh, which came out in 2009. Um, it's noteworthy, I think, that around 1994 is when this Amy... think 
opened about that time, 94, 95. Also, um, um, oh gosh, the Spielberg's movie, um, Schindler's List, I think came out around the same time. So the public awareness in this country of the Holocaust had been raised quite dramatically over a short period of time. And so uh, that contributed to, I think, my mother's willingness as well to, to, speak, to, uh, to speak to me for the book. And I think that the, the, the most important point is the reason she did it is she felt she finally understood the importance of her story, not just her story, but all such stories um, being preserved for, especially for future generations like Amy's and beyond. And so um, that was really the catalyst uh, for, for getting the book done. And um, if it hadn't been for that letter, probably it never, it probably never would have happened. My mother's not alone among Holocaust survivors in their reluctance to, to talk about it. Some have, and Mitch, you're aware of many of them. You've worked with some of them. Um, and, but, but many, many have kept it to themselves, as my, as my mother did. So um, that's how I became aware of it. And um, um, that led to um, that book and then a follow-up book about the, about the further, a closer look at the Holocaust in Ukraine, in which I learned a number of other things that we don't have to talk about right now, but um, broadened my sense that we had lost in this country the, this entire earlier, you know, uh, beginning chapter of the Holocaust. And we're still catching up in terms of getting this story out to the, uh, you know, to, to people, uh, people at large. Sure. And, and Greg, I'd like to just comment on a few of the things you just said. The first one being, of course, that um, these events that, that survivors experienced were, were deeply traumatic for them. And it is very frequent that people who've been traumatized don't want to relive those events. Um, I think it's, it's remarkable over the years that as many Holocaust survivors uh, have become willing to speak, as has actually turned out to be the case. Um, but for many, it took it took years to come to that point. Um, and, and I think for, for everyone in the Institute, as a teacher, uh, we should remember one basic principle. Um, events of history are from the past, but history is always told in the present. And so the... Um, the culture in which we live has a shaping influence on how stories are told. And for those of you in the Institute who are young teachers, uh, just take my word for this, uh, times have changed very much in the United States from the 1950s until now. Um, in the 1950s and 60s and even in the 70s, people just didn't share that level of personal information about their lives as, as people are more comfortable doing today. Um, and, and so, you know, especially with the advent of social media, uh, people are willing to, to talk about their own lives in, in great detail in ways that just seem very alien to those of us who remember an earlier time. Uh, so it's not surprising that survivors didn't always want to share with their, with their neighbors or even their own children um, these, these very personal and very traumatic stories which had happened to them. True, and one thing I'll say that many people may be thinking, uh, maybe thinking right now, is uh, uh, something that it's also true is that many, many uh, war veterans in this country uh, who were not involved in the Holocaust in any way, uh, many veterans are also equally hesitant to speak about their uh, about their experiences. I mean, almost every day it seems like you read an obituary or a story of a World War II vet. Uh, and their and their family says, "Gee, we, you know, he won this medal or that medal. We never knew about it until two years ago, or he just never talked about it." And so that was quite common in that in that generation, not just among the Holocaust survivors, but among uh, among those who fought in the wars in this country and veterans. One thing, I, as you were speaking, I realized I should have. Some people may be wondering. I have to explain that. I wanted to say that after my mother um, told me her story. Uh, and I, I, well, when I was doing the interviews, I should say for the book, I asked her at one point, I said, why didn't you tell me when we were growing up, my brother and I, why didn't you ever tell us about what happened to you in the war? And she, she said, you know, she said, because I just 
I felt it was too cruel to tell to tell children about this, and I wanted you to have normal childhoods. And it sounds simple, but it's she's so right. It was what she was doing was sparing the trauma you were referring to. Um, that she felt it was um, she thought of it as cruel, and what she what did happen to she and her uh, to her and her family and others was terribly horribly cruel. Uh, but um, but she was she wanted to spare us any trauma that we might suffer from that by telling us that. And so she didn't. She kept it to herself. And we did have happy childhoods that were indistinguishable from all the childhoods, uh, you know, of our friends around us. Um, and that that trauma that trauma is is real. Uh, there's a uh, again. I didn't know until I um, did research for the for the other book is that there's a whole body of literature that's grown up in this country over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, they're basically memoirs and books that were written by what are called, well, second generation survivors. The first generation would be like people like my mother. I would be the second generation. And you can look them up. There are countless uh, uh, books that have been written by these second generation um, uh, survivors, many of whom uh, heard these stories when they were young. It was part of their family life. Um, you know, if you lived in Indiana, which had in Bloomington, had very few Jews. We didn't go to synagogue. It was easy, and there was almost nothing taught in the public schools about this. It was easy to to stay sheltered and not, for me, never to to think to ask my mother anything about the Holocaust. If you lived in some place like New York or L.A., where there were a large number of Jewish immigrants, and, it, and your family was religious and attended synagogue, it would be impossible for you not at some point when you were young to find out about this. It would have to be part of your life as, as Jews. But that wasn't my case. So I was, I was in fact, sheltered uh, from it. But many of those who, uh, who, uh, those who uh, heard about these stories from their parents, these second generation survivors, they found that when they got into their teenage years and early 20s, that they started experiencing emotional problems, psychological problems for which they couldn't account. They had had good lives. There was no reason for them to have um, emotional problems. And many of them who ended up in therapy uh, found, discovered that the roots of, that, of, of their problems was a kind of suppressed trauma that was a result of them hearing the stories of the Holocaust from their parents when they were very young. Because when you're three, four, five, six, seven, ten years old, you, you know, and you're told stories about these horrible things that happen, it is a natural instinct, is a defense mechanism, especially for children, to suppress that. Um, it's hard enough for, for adults to, to, uh, to, to understand, to try to make sense of, of those events. But for children, it was suppressed, and, and that suppressed, uh, and that suppression eventually, you know, uh, manifests itself in, in trauma. Which and 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 so, yes, there was that whole. My mother really uh, made the right decision for us in in, in sheltering us uh, from the uh, from uh, from that uh, from that story. Um, Greg, if I could jump in here for a second, I um, this this may not be. Um, appropriate for uh, a discussion of um, uh, of your book, but uh, we're friends and I'm going to ask you to indulge me. Um, there's another second generation survivor who has made a, a career as a storyteller, but he works in the venue of, um, of, of art. And uh, his name is Art Spiegelman. Oh, he's, yeah. a, he's a graphic oh. novelist, and um, and he wrote a two-volume story of his father uh, account of his father's story in the Holocaust called Mouse, yes. uh, Mouse One and Mouse Two, M A U S, mm -hmm. and um, and the subtext of the book of both volumes is his trauma at the experience of having been the son of a Holocaust survivor who did not shelter him. Um, from the stories of of what he had lived through, and so you know, in, in a way, his his telling of the story is very different from yours in the sense that not only because the two survivors had very different experiences, but they were very different as parents. 
subsequently. And, and your mother sheltered you and you have a life as you have had uh, built partly on the fact that she protected you when you were young from these, uh, from this understanding. And, and um, I, I highly recommend that, that people read Mouse, uh, but don't just read it as the story of what happened to Art Spiegelman's father. Read it as the story of what happened to Art Spiegelman. Yes, um, absolutely. Quite and, and I believe those two, you know, your story and his sort of are, are opposites of uh, on a spectrum. Yeah, that's such a, such a good point, such an astute point, because, because you're exactly right. And what you'll find that those who have read Hiding in Spotlight, if you do, you'll find that compared to, to, to Mouse, what Spiegel, Spiegelman's work, which is raw and, and exudes that sense of, of trauma that, that he ex the experienced. You read mine, mine is you know, partly because I had been a reporter uh, all my life. It, it will seem very repertorial. I tried to, tried to make it interesting with enough, uh, to make it, uh, to put enough uh, 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 content in there to make it personal to, so people would feel some of these things but it's nothing like mouse and and yes it's uh, it, it does it it seems more repertorial which it is um but it's a it's a and also as you said represents the difference in his his experiences as a child and mine i mean when i heard when i heard my mother's story i was a fully formed emotionally fully formed adult i mean i was married i had two kids and at that point you, you have built up some shields you know, a, and, and you can deal with uh, stories of this kind much better than a child can. So uh, that's an excellent, I, I think, to, to uh, first of all, even be mentioned in the same breath with Spiegelman is very nice. Thank you very much. But, it's, uh, <laughs> but that's a really, really excellent point. And, uh, yeah. Well, and I'd also like to say to the teachers um, that, that this is a cautionary note. Um, that especially if you have younger students, we should be very, very careful to, to expose them to the history of the Holocaust in a way that's not traumatizing. Um, and that does not necessarily entail withholding all of the information, but presenting it in a way that's not traumatizing. I have a colleague in, in, at Yad Vashem in Israel, and I wanna tell you uh, her formulation of of this idea and I want to give her credit for it her name is Shulamit Imber and and Shulamit always says that when we teach children about the Holocaust we have to bring them in safely and bring them out safely um, and and I, I believe in that idea um, and, and I've always uh, responded to teachers who ask me for raw material so that they can shock students I've advised them against it because there's very little educational value to, to shock. Um, and it's one of the great challenges of teaching about the Holocaust to, to talk about it in a realistic way uh, that's not traumatizing. But that's why we hold an institute to help people to be able to do this. I, you know, now that you put it in those, in those terms, I, I shuddered, I mean, just imagining myself up in front of a class of young people as the teacher, not as a guest teacher who comes in, you know, but as the person responsible for perhaps conveying, exposing them for the first time of the Holocaust, it's a daunting thought because you're, yeah, and it, because yes, the, the risks you would run of, of conveying the wrong information, the, the, the could injure them in the ways you described is, is pretty daunting. So it's, it's, it, it needs the kind of attention that I think you give it at the Institute and people need to think deeply about it uh, because you can't, once, once you give kids the wrong information and they absorb it and they create an impression in their minds, you can't get it back. You really can't. And uh, um, so, yes, very delicate matter. And um, the hiding the spotlight is written. And there's, I mean, there is there is some uh, there is some not a lot of graphic descriptions, but certainly um, uh, startling startling facts and to some extent some descriptions um, that are suitable, certainly wouldn't be suitable for a, a young audience, uh, but certainly nothing before like middle school. Um, and then it would be best that it would be, uh, it's good for middle school. We've talked, we've spoken, as you probably know, we've spoken to 
Candy and I have spoken to many, many middle schools, and those kids are find the story you know, quite interesting, riveting, because it's about people their own age. My mother was 14, her sister was 12 when this started, so they can relate to that. And also, uh, one great advantage is that Hiding the Spotlight, unlike um, almost all Holocaust stories, has, uh, relatively speaking, a happy ending. They do survive, they do get to this country, and so on. Um, uh, which unfortunately is not the way most Holocaust stories end. So it's suitable for that age and, and above. But yes, uh, the younger, but for younger students, younger than that, that's a very, very delicate matter. Indeed. So Greg, you mentioned that, uh, that you have spoken to students and your wife Candy has spoken to students. Uh, can you think of um, any questions you've received directly from students that you found to be particularly compelling? Hmm. Wow, there's so many questions. I'm trying to think. Uh, I wish I'd had a lot to think about that before I came came on. Um, maybe just a second. Candy, I think, has a good question. Yes. Hmm. Yes. This is not a question so much, Mitch, but it's something that's so poignant. That's so poignant that to mention it. That after we spoke at one school, it was a middle school. A boy came up. And he said that he, he felt so bad he kind of wanted to apologize because, because, he had, because his family was German. And that he felt, I guess he felt, I didn't use this word, but I think he felt you know, ashamed when he heard this story. And that the people like him, his ancestors, he could have been part of something like this. And, and um, so that was very sad and kind of very poignant to hear that. And it, it shows how deeply these kids think about this. And, and, um, uh, and yeah, yeah, about the Nazis. One thing, one thing we always did uh, in these, always do at these when we speak to students this age, and that is to make a distinction between Germans and Nazis. We would say, all, you know, not all Germans were Nazis. Um, and, uh, to be a member of the Nazi Party, there, you know, that was a, they were, that was a much smaller group, smaller percentage of Germans, um, and and that uh, much less the soldiers and the and the high command that actually, you know, uh, conducted the uh, conducted the uh, Holocaust itself. Um, so we always want to make that distinction. Uh, it's important when because kids are very literal minded, and 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 we always. We always make sure to uh, to talk about that. Um, now, now, Greg, this is not an advantage that you have, but it is one that, that I might have in that circumstance in that fully 50% of my family heritage is German. Mm. And and so if a kid comes to me and says, my family was from Germany, I can say mine was too. Uh -huh. um, and, um, and, and, you know, here we are deploring the crime as we should. Um, but we should remember that there is no such thing in this world or should be no such thing in this world as inherited guilt. Um, that's a yeah. monstrous concept to think that, that somebody can inherit guilt from the past. On the other hand, uh, there is the idea of inheriting responsibility to learn from the past and to build a better future. But that's something that we all share regardless of background. Um, you know, I would think that the, the child of a, of a, a Nazi and the child of a Holocaust survivor both inherit the responsibility to learn from this history and make a better world because of our new knowledge. Well, that, that's a great, uh, important distinction. Let me give you a living example of that. Um, the, the German government to this very day um, provides reparations to, um, to survivors in this country. Every year, my mother gets a check from the German government for, I've forgotten what the amount is, but it's several thousand dollars as reparations for, for you know, for, for, the, for the war, for the Holocaust. And yes, some may say, well, how can you put a price on, on what happened to her? You can't. But it is an acknowledgement of their, of their, as you were saying, their responsibility. It's not their personal responsibility, but, uh, but, the, but they say this happened under the name of flag of our country and not the Third Reich anymore, but their country. And so they've taken that responsibility. And they also created a fund that provides 
um, assistance to, to now a, a decreasing number of Holocaust survivors like my mother, some practical love, uh, some practical benefits. Uh, they, they, uh, she gets uh, from her local Holocaust center there, uh, they receive the funds to provide to survivors for home services of various kinds, whether it's whether it's food assistance or housekeeping or whatever, and they and they the German government provides that as well. So that's it's 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 on a practical level that's that's great. It's very helpful, but more importantly, at a symbolic level, it's the as you were saying it shows the German government taking responsibility, and and no one really they don't need to say it that really because we should know that obviously the Andrew Merkels of the world and, uh, and, and others before, the, before her were not responsible. They should feel no personal shame or guilt for, for, the, for the Holocaust, but they do take responsibility. And so that's, a very, that's, that's very true. And it's something that, by the way, should can be modeled in other countries around the world. And um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be a little more explicit and yeah. say that um, while it was not a smooth and easy road for Germany to get to the point it's at today, and and no, there are no guarantees for the future as to how this history will be will be remembered over the long term. Um, but I think a lot of countries could learn from the way that Germany has accepted responsibility uh, for acknowledging the crimes of the of the Third Reich era and formulating policies to, to make sure that those crimes would not be repeated um, in, in their area um, and under their watch. So, um, so I think a lot of countries could do well on that. Absolutely. For example, um, in Germany, if it's against the law to to use in any way the swastika, uh, you you can't use it in publications. It's against the law. You can't use you can't use Nazi uh, the swastika or other Nazi insignia. It's uh, it's verboten, and um, and they also have a fantastic one of the world's best Holocaust uh, memorials in in Berlin, and and so they they have been really very very. In the vanguard of, of enlightened vanguard of, of Holocaust of Holocaust uh, remembrance, um, uh, I would say it's not directly related to Germany, but you know in Israel I think it is still it's still against the law in, in Israel to to uh, I think to perform Wagner's music. Uh, I think they uh, they, they passed think, a barrier of of that not being true anymore, but for many years it was for sure. I used to think it used to, I thought, I always thought the real reason was Wagner is just so wretched, but it turned out. But, uh, but anyway, it's, uh, um, but no, Germany has been exemplary in that, in that way. Um, so. So Greg, we're, we're down to the last few minutes in this recording. Um, so I wanted to ask you, if, if you had a, a personal message that you would like to deliver directly to the teachers in the Institute. Gee, Mitch, you might have given me that. <laughs> but uh, I would say, it's, without, trying to, without trying to figure it out or get too fancy, I would say um, find a book, um, whatever your level is, um, find a book that will, uh, that will um, best inform, enlighten your, your students and really spend time on it. Um, and it could be... Um, and to try to personalize it in some way. I don't mean the teacher's personal story in any way, um, but, to, um, uh, but to have kids stop, have the time to stop and think about what they're, about what they're, about what they're reading. And, um, and, 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 as part of, and as part of considering, thinking about what happened to people like my mother and her sister um, and, and what happens even continues to happen today in other ways is um, something you're familiar with is this whole notion of, of being upstanders, of being upstanders. And that if you see, so much has been said about the Holocaust that if people had, they said if people had simply had, had, had said something, if they'd done something, if they had stood up for Jews who were being persecuted at the time. And so and to, as it, it applies to our world now, where persecution and bias and, and, um, is, and is, is still a real thing. Uh, in, involving not Jews primarily, but other groups, that to 
so as not to they this old the old bromide about if you those who don't uh, don't uh, uh, study history are doomed to repeat it. That will happen if you in in our country, any society, if people stand by and don't step up and intercede um, if they see that someone is being persecuted uh, or harassed uh, in in some in some way, and to be the person who stands up, the upstanders. And to, that's something that kids understand because it happens on playgrounds at a very trivial level, you know, uh, when kids are ostracized for whatever silly reason by. But be the one who steps in and, and doesn't let that happen. Kids understand that at that level. And um, so uh, that would be one, to, one way to, to, look, to, to bring this, these, this incredible history, which may seem overwhelming to them, down to, to a personal level for them. And to think about the world, but also think about the playground. Think about the lunchroom. Think about the other places where, where there's human interaction, where people may be subject to, to, um, to, to discrimination and bias. And um, last thing I wanted to say is that you mentioned earlier about how there had been people who had stepped up to do this. There were people who stepped up during the war to do this. And uh, my mother and her sister were protected uh, in, for two weeks at the outset of after they their parents were were murdered at the um, in uh, the killing field, they went back to their hometown and a Christian family took them in uh, for two weeks and hid them, and much to their own peril. I mean, if they had been to they'd been discovered harboring two Jews, they would have been they would have been murdered by the Nazis along with my mother and her sister. But they they put their own lives on on the line, took them in for two weeks before sending them on their way, on their journey, and um, with their new, their new names. And that family, the Bogancha family, the name is Bogancha family, oh, six or eight years ago, they were formally um, designated uh, righteous Gentiles. It's the highest honor that the state of Israel can give to, non, to a non-Jew, is to be a righteous Gentile. And there are only a few of them, relatively speaking, throughout the world about um uh about oh i think several thousands of these people who have been officially recognized by the state of israel as righteous gentiles and that and so that's uh those people such people such people do exist and and anybody they can be a model for others who will step up in not less necessarily such cataclysmic horrific circumstances but even lesser ones we had the good fortune to to visit the um uh, a member of that family, a still living member of that family, when we visited Ukraine and Haiku. And we went down and we saw the hidden space in the floor, under the, in the kitchen, the floorboard, where they had created a hiding space uh, for my mother and, uh, and her sister. And, um, and we had the good fortune to go and to, to visit that family and to, and to thank that one existing, that one lasting surviving member of the family for what her, for what her family had done a generation earlier. You know, Greg, um, it, it's appropriate at this point to say that just about every survivor of the Holocaust at some point in their story encountered someone who helped them. Um, whether it was a full-blown rescue activity like hiding someone in their home or, or uh, providing ongoing support or whether it was a momentary choice to, to act in a humane and caring manner. Um, and, and so it becomes very tempting for us as teachers to center our teaching around the idea that there are rescuers. Uh, but they were a minuscule part of the, the population at large. And that doesn't make their stories less important. In a way, it makes them more important. Uh, because, but it also shows that it was possible. Even in the worst of times, it was possible to, to hang on to your, your, your most uh, humane values and, and to behave as a, as a decent human being towards others. Um, but of course, when we talk about survivors, it's important for all of us to remember that the survivors themselves were a very small percentage of the total number of Jewish people who fell under German rule during World War II, uh, a very small percentage. So, um, so survivors, almost all of them had at least one rescuer at some point along the line. But if you look at the flip side of that coin, 
most had no rescuer and most did not survive. Last thought about that, that in some cases, um, people rescued by these extraordinary individuals, but sometimes societies fail. Uh, the story of the, the, the St. Louis, the, the ship that, uh, uh, that was uh, that sailed from Germany in 1939, I believe it was. That's right. We just passed the anniversary of that. It was in May. And maybe you've discussed that, maybe you've discussed that at the Institute, but uh, it was a, I think the ship had, uh, I think several hundred Jews on it in addition to others. And uh, they were trying to escape the looming, the looming Holocaust. And they came to this, they wanted to land, come to this country. The United States would not let the ship uh, uh, dock in the US and neither would Cuba or anybody else. And uh, so we turned them away. This country turned them away. And that, that ship returned to Germany and most, most of the Jews on that, on that, um, on that ship uh, perished in the Holocaust. So we failed as a country to be upstanders at that point. And, and, uh, and I, I want to say to the teachers in the meeting, um, I'd be happy to, to talk to you about the story of the St. Louis and how it fits into the context of, of America at that time. Uh, we wouldn't have a chance to, to do it in a, uh, in a detailed way right here in, this, in these last few minutes, but, um, but I'd be happy to and uh, also to put teachers onto the track of some, some online resources where they can learn more about the St. Louis. And, and in general about American immigration policy and refugee policy at that time. Um, of course, uh, Greg's mother uh, would not have, have really been in the category of Jewish people who might have found escape to the United States during the war, uh, given where she lived. Uh, her ability to come afterwards, of course, was a life-changing experience for her and for her family. and. Um, and uh, you know we, we can say that um, it would have been wonderful if if Jana's family had been able to escape to territory not occupied by Germany, but for them at that time that would have been escape into the Soviet deeper into the Soviet Union into Russian territory um, rather than to the United States, just given where they were from. Absolutely, and uh, also it's worth mentioning that. My mother always wanted to return to the Soviet Union after the war. Her sister didn't. It's a good thing they didn't because uh, Jews who returned, who had left the Soviet Union for whatever reason, even forcibly by the, and had left the Soviet Union during the war and came back, were, re forcefully, were forcefully repatriated with, the Eisen with Eisenhower's, unfortunately, with Eisenhower's approval. Um, many of them were were either killed or sent to Siberia because Stalin, who was crazy, as crazy or crazier even than Hitler, he regarded any Jews, anybody, even soldiers who were outside of Germany after the war as somehow traitors. And when they returned to Germany, when they returned to um, the Soviet Union, um, they were, they were, many of them were, most of them were killed or sent to Siberia. So it's a good thing they didn't go back because they probably would not have survived. Um, so um, anyway, it's, um, it's so many different aspects to this story that what ifs that, uh, and thank goodnesses. And <laughs> so, but. Yes. And, and Greg, I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time to, uh, to share your, your story and your insights with teachers. I want to give you one other opportunity. Um, Hiding in the Spotlight was not the last book that you wrote that touched on this subject. Um, would you say a few words about about what came next for you? Yes, it was it was a it was a something I didn't plan to do. It was a follow up to Hiding in the Spotlight. It's called Judgment Bef Before Nuremberg. Okay, Judgment Before Nuremberg. The reason I wrote this book is that to put it. Briefly, when I my first trip to Ukraine um, to to research hiding in the spotlight, I went to a small Holocaust museum there, and um, I saw a photo display of a trial, and uh, I looked at it. It was a it was a lots of black and white photos of uh, of a trial, and there I saw several German soldiers standing in the dock, and then I saw uh, photos of them being hanged in the public square, and I sort of looked at it and it, 
it's said that these, these three German officers and a Russian collaborator had been tried and convicted of their, tried and convicted of their crimes uh, and, and executed publicly in, in Haikov in Kharkov. But the date was December 1943. And I looked at it and I thought, well, that can't be the case. December 43, that was like before the end of the war, far before, a year and a half before the end of the war. And so I thought, how could that be? And I didn't put that in hiding in the spotlight. But, I, uh, but later on, I started thinking about it. And I did, I did research. And I found that, of course, the, we're all familiar in this country, going back to this familiar narrative, this conventional wisdom, is everybody almost who at least has a dim awareness of the Holocaust knows, that the, knows about the Nuremberg trials, the famous Nuremberg trials that were conducted in the, started in November 1945 after the end of the war. And the high command, Goering and those people were put on trial <clears throat> at the Nuremberg trials, and which had been, there was a famous movie made about the Nuremberg trials called uh, Justice, Justice at Nuremberg, Justice at Nuremberg with, with uh, Spencer Tracy, Maximilian Schell, came out in 1961. <clears throat> well, this is a definitive piece of popular art that, 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 that acquainted people with the Holocaust, his judgment at Nuremberg. But that was 1945. And so I discovered that this actually the first trial of Germans, Nazis, for their crimes had been conducted in Ukraine in December 1943. And I found that nobody in this country, virtually nobody knew about it, even many Holocaust uh, scholars I spoke to. And I just didn't get how that could be the case. So I decided that to look more into, the, into this, and I found, discovered a lot even more about the history of the Holocaust in Ukraine. <clears throat> and felt it was worthy, it was symbolic of how little Americans knew about what happened in Ukraine, to go back to the beginning of our discussion, and that it could be the focal point of a follow-up book that, that took a closer look at that. And, and so it was a, because it was about that trial, that's why I called it Judgment Before Nuremberg, because that is the first place the Germans were tried for their crimes. It, but it was more than, it was important not just for the prosecution, prosecution of these individuals, the, the, um, uh, the evidence that had been gathered by the Soviets during the course of the war uh, that was used in this trial was then forwarded to the, was used by the prosecutors at Nuremberg after the war and uh, to, to, to prosecute the high command and the other, the other officers. And so it also established important legal precedents uh, about, the, uh, about the crime of, about the crimes uh, that were committed during the war. So it wasn't just the prosecution, it was the fact that it established a legal framework that led to the, led to the, and uh, uh, was used in the, <clears throat> in the Nuremberg trials that everybody in Germany after the war that everybody's familiar with. So that's what the second book is about. <clears throat> Excuse me. About that and also more about my personal journey in writing the book um, and how it affected our family. Uh, in, in ways that um, I don't go into in hiding from spotlight. So um, it further illuminates all of the, those things. Um, and I learned every, every, I learned a tremendous amount of, uh, in doing these, in doing these books, um, um, probably went to the library more than I ever did in my entire career as a student in school and college. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, but it was a tremendous education for me, and I think that um, uh, as a typical American, I'll put it that way, who knew so little. So that's what the second book is about. And um, uh, it, if anybody wants a really much deeper, closer look at what happened in Ukraine, I tried to, to put, the, put it in there. Um, there's a ton of scholarship, a uh, growing num amount of scholarship, but it's kind of hard to get at. And uh, this, I, this book attempts to, to put it in terms that written in a way that would be um, more accessible to, to people like a, myself, lay, lay people who are interested in the topic, but uh, not scholars. And uh, uh, so uh, thank you for the opportunity. Well, Greg, I want to say thank you very much uh, on, on my own personal behalf, but also on behalf of all of the attendees at the Teachers Institute this year for taking your time uh, to share your, your 
your personal story as as a second generation survivor, as an author, um, as uh, as a, a member of our community, as a good friend of the Holocaust Center, uh, we are just so grateful to you that you've um, you you've taken the time to do this for us. And um, would you be willing if um, you know, teachers will watch this uh, this recording? Um, most will watch it on on Tuesday, June the second. Um, if they have any questions, would you be willing for me to forward those questions to you um, it, by email? I would be happy to do so. It would it'd be my pleasure, Mitch. I, yeah, absolutely. Please do that. Tell them <clears throat> any question they care to ask me. Just don't don't be shy. You know, and um, um, I don't know how many of them. Uh, may have ever seen any of our presentations when Candy and, do, and I do our presentations. She made a wonderful 17 minute film about our trip to Ukraine and uh, showing many of the people and the places in the book. And uh, we, we usually showed that uh, film at all of our presentations. And she also wrote a play that's been presented uh, based on the story uh, that uh, been presented in, in three states and screenplay, which was optioned by a filmmaker. We're still hoping that gets done. I, I, I think it would make a tremendous movie, but you know, we're biased, right? <laughs> so, but uh, yes, please forward any and all questions uh, to me. I'd be pleased. And thank you so much for all the times we've worked together. And uh, it's been a wonderful privilege to, to do, to add whatever I could to the, to the mission of the, of the Holocaust Center. And we're so fortunate to have it here. Um, and uh, someone as far as sort of visionary in the way you've done it there, uh, so. Well, thank you very much, Greg, and, and you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon and evening, and I think all of us look forward to the next opportunity that we have to see you. Thank you, Mitch. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.